Every few months, it seems like there's another mass shooting or terrorist attack taking place. And every single time, the establishment media and the investigating authorities fail to provide us with all of the relevant facts. And that's why I'm making this video, to help do my part to potentially expose the truth. I want to start with Operation Northwoods, which was officially declassified on the 18th of November 1997 by the JFK Assassination Record Review Board. In these absolutely shocking documents which were kept secret and hidden from the public for over 30 years, what we learn is the CIA, along with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which are comprised of the highest ranking members of each branch of the military, they literally came up with a plot to attack the local civilian North American population through mass shootings and acts of terrorism. This was then to be blamed on Cuba's government to justify an invasion of their country. Uh, uh, U.S. personnel uh, from the CIA and other places secretly create terrorism in the United States. The documents actually said people would be shot on American streets, bombs would be blown up. Um, and again, all this, the evidence would be uh, laid to point the finger at Castro. Now, fortunately, then President John F. Kennedy refused to go through with this absolutely insane plan. But as we all know, JFK is no longer with us today. But criminal elements within the U.S. government undoubtedly remain. And therefore, any time there is a mass shooting or terror attack, we have to consider this logical possibility. But it gets even crazier, guys. Because more than 60 years ago, through projects Artichoke and MKUltra, the CIA developed the capability to successfully brainwash average civilians to become mind-controlled assassins. For example, in 1954, the four years before the Manchurian Candidate novel had been uh, published, the Central Intelligence Agency had a team to build Manchurian candidates to commit assassinations. And one of the most frightening memos that I've read uh, is a, an experiment that they wanted to run to be able to program somebody to assassinate a foreign head of state or an American official. Surely this is just some conspiracy theory. What evidence is there to really support this? I'm interested in the historical fact. And the, the historical fact for me has come from Central Intelligence Agency documents. And the, the documents definitely established that by 1954, the CIA, or at least the component that did the hypnosis research, was convinced that they could program people into committing assassinations. The declassified document that the professor references in this interview is from February 10th, 1954. I have linked it in the description box for you to fact check for yourself. And from this document, we can read the following. Miss Unknown was then instructed, having previously expressed a fear of firearms in any fashion, that she would use every method at her disposal to awaken Miss Anonymous who is now in a deep hypnotic sleep, and failing in this, she would pick up a pistol nearby and fire it at Miss Anonymous. She was instructed that her rage would be so great that she would not hesitate to kill Miss Anonymous for failing to awaken. Miss Unknown carried out these suggestions to the letter, including firing the unloaded pneumatic pistol gun at Miss Anonymous, and then proceeding to fall into a deep sleep. After proper suggestions were made, both were awakened and expressed complete amnesia for the entire sequence. Miss Unknown was again handed the gun, which she refused in an awakened state to pick up or accept from the operator. She expressed absolute denial that the foregoing sequence had even happened. This was over 60 years ago guys. And it's not the only verifiable evidence we have available either. Two and a half years prior to this experiment, declassified documents, which I once again will be linking for you to fact check, 
These documents, dated September 25th, 1951, show that the CIA developed the capability to brainwash an innocent civilian into carrying out a hypothetical bombing. The ramifications of this should lead us to question everything. Because not only do we now have historical incontrovertible evidence that the CIA had plans to murder innocent civilians and make it look like Cuba did it, but we also have historical incontestable evidence that they can brainwash innocent civilians into carrying out mass shootings and terror attacks. Now as shocking as this all is, we need to remain calm and focus on seeking the truth and asking some serious questions guys, such as why does the media and investigating authorities never mention this? Obviously it's incredibly relevant to any and all investigations. And why aren't we taught about this in school? And perhaps the most relevant question of all. Have they been able to successfully do this in a real world situation? And do we have any potential proof? It was Senator Robert F. Kennedy's victory speech following the California primary. Now it's on to Chicago and let's win there. The speech would be his last. As the senator and his entourage made their exit through the pantry at the Ambassador Hotel, shots rang out. Sirhan Bashara Sirhan, a 24-year-old Palestinian, would be convicted and eventually sentenced to life. Out of every incident that I have ever researched regarding the potential for a mind-controlled assassin, none is as compelling as that of Sirhan Sirhan. The official story claims that Sirhan single-handedly engaged in a mass shooting that injured five innocent bystanders and killed presidential hopeful Robert F. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy's younger brother. What's not mentioned, however, is that Sirhan's gun could only hold eight bullets, but it has since been scientifically proven that more than eight bullets were fired and they were fired from two totally different weapons. But Prague has come to a new conclusion. There had to have been two guns. That's because he's identified 13 shots on the recording and plotted them all on his computer screen. This is shot seven and shot eight. And in two instances, he's identified the shots just milliseconds apart. That tells us that there had to have been a second gun firing in that pantry because it's impossible for an individual, any individual, to shoot an Ivor Johnson Cadet 55 that rapidly. An Ivor Johnson Cadet, similar to this one, was the gun Sirhan used. It only holds eight bullets. The other shots, according to his audio analysis, came from an H&R 922 like this one, fired, he says, by a mystery gunman. I'm forced to conclude that these two bullets were fired by two different guns. The bullet recovered from Kennedy's neck, Exhibit 47, and the bullet recovered from Weissel's abdomen, Exhibit 54, just do not match. However, Mr. Harper double-checked. He also compared the Kennedy bullet with a test bullet from Exhibit 55, and they do not match either. This evidence, which undoubtedly proves there was a second shooter involved, was also corroborated by multiple eyewitnesses. I also told him that the guard pulled out the gun and everyone told me that in the confusion I I, I didn't see what I saw. Well, I didn't see everything that happened that night mm -hmm. because of the blinding lights and the people screaming, but the things that I did see, I'm sure about, and that is Kennedy being shot three times. The guard definitely pulled out his gun and fired. Well, the FBI came to my home when I was living in Los Angeles and interviewed me and I told them that there were between 12 and 14 shots. I told them I'd want to be a witness and then they left and I got a phone call about 10, 11 years ago. I was never called. I was never questioned. I was very frustrated about the conclusion uh, that there was only one shooter and Philip Melanson, who is a, a professor at Dartmouth, called me about 10, 11 years ago and he interviewed me saying he would like to revive uh, the the case and he then sent me a copy of the FBI report 
which was devastating. It was 14 different statements that they misconstrued, misrepresented what I said. I, I promise you I said between 12 and 14 shots, and they put down that I said eight. But that's not all that they did either, guys. They also destroyed both forensic and photographic evidence. The LAPD promised to return all of Venyard's films, but when he called at the Parker Center Police Headquarters, his photographs were locked in a security cabinet. And uh, I was not allowed to look at the film. Uh, they took a stack of prints and one of the detectives shuffled through them and separated it into two piles. And basically he gave me the photographs from one roll of film uh, leading up to the assassination, uh, and then everything after the assassination, everything that I had taken in the pantry was gone. Those photographs, which might have either proved or destroyed the prosecution case, had been incinerated by order of the LAPD. If the police department was right, then my photographs only would have, would have proved that they were right. So uh, for them to destroy it uh, uh, only leads me to believe that, uh, that something's being covered up. And the autopsy results show that Kennedy was shot within inches from behind. But all witnesses, every single one, place Sirhan in front of Kennedy and say he never even came close to him. The evidence of a major cover-up here is absolutely incontestable. But in relation to the greater topic in question, it has been proven on multiple occasions by multiple experts from both the defense and the prosecution that Sohan had amnesia for the entire event and is extremely hypnotizable. Psychiatrists for both the defense and prosecution testified that Sirhan did have amnesia for the assassination. But to this day, no psychiatrist has found any evidence of psychosis in Sirhan which scientists consider another possible cause of amnesia. Melanson became convinced that Sirhan's lack of memory is the result of being hypnotized and programmed to kill. After 15 years of analyzing the evidence and interviewing experts and witnesses, the only logical conclusion in this case, for my mind, is that Sirhan Sirhan was a programmed assassin, programmed to show up shooting at Robert Kennedy, and programmed not to remember. In more recent history, another case eerily similar to that of Sohan Sohan is James Holmes, who is alleged to have single-handedly gunned down 12 innocent civilians and injured 58 others. And once again, we find multiple eyewitnesses claiming that there was a potential second shooter. From what we saw, he wasn't alone. He had someone with him uh, because the, the second can of tear gas didn't come from his side. From what we saw, he wasn't alone. He had someone with him uh, because the, the second can of tear gas didn't come from his side. This prospect of a second gunman was further corroborated by police audio, as well as a second gas mask that was found reportedly hundreds of feet away from where James Holmes had been arrested as well as where the shooting had taken place. In addition to all this, Holmes, like Sirhan, claimed he had amnesia for the entire event and according to a former inmate that befriended him in jail James Holmes actually believed that his psychiatrist who just so happens to be a former employee of the military he believes that she actually brainwashed him into carrying out the shooting furthermore James Holmes had no military experience whatsoever he had a bright future ahead of him and he has been described by those who knew him personally as happy, nice and non-violent. Yet despite this, we are told that he suddenly went insane and single-handedly carried out this highly skilled, ruthless operation. And then he calmly and patiently awaited arrest afterwards without trying to run away or fight back. And then we are also told that this guy booby trapped his home with bombs with such a degree of professionalism that it has been described by experts as something they had never seen in the United States, only in war zones in the Middle East. These examples of course are just two of many instances in which the official story simply does not add up. And based upon the evidence that has been presented in this video, it's only logical that we question every single one of these shootings and terrorist attacks.
It should also be mentioned that this justified skepticism should not be relegated to the US alone. Throughout history, governments all over the world have engaged in false flag attacks to justify their own selfish agendas. Now I understand coming to terms with this information can be very difficult and disturbing to say the least. But we are not actually the ones that should be afraid. For we are many and they are few. We simply have to become aware that regardless of our race, skin color, religion, political affiliation or otherwise, we all actually want to live in peace and freedom. It is only a small minority of psychopaths that want to perpetuate war, division, and exploitation. But once we become aware of their deceptive ways, then we can begin to work towards freeing ourselves from their toxic presence. Now I'm not expecting you to go out and save the world my friends, but each and every one of us can help to spread the truth. Because what we are ultimately in bondage to is deception, ignorance, and lies. But as the truth begins to grow stronger, so too will the power of the people. And it is through the power of the people that we can create a much better world for all.